Welcome. What is the most general finite geometric structure we can think of? Mirror, mirror on the wall, what is the most general finite geometric structure of them all? I argue that it's the structure of delta z. It's a nice topos and uh, it contains quite a few other structures like simplicity complexes, multigraphs, quivers we have seen. Actually, these are just one dimensional delta sets essentially. We have simplicial sets, which is also a special case. It has more structure, it has more constraints. And uh, I wanted actually to say something also about generality. What do we actually mean when we mean more general for a category? And it's not only that the objects have to be contained in each other, but that's also that the morphisms. So that's also part of a category. So here, a kind of a couple of examples. Of course, a monoid is an algebraic structure which has less structure, so less conditions than a group. So we have not an inverse element and topological space. Not every topological space is a metric space. Metric spaces are topological spaces, but not every topological space is metrizable. So a smooth manifold can always carry a Riemannian structure. It's more interesting, right? It can always carry a Riemannian manifold structure, there's always a Riemannian metric, but it's less general here because the morphisms are more constrained, right? You want to have, you know, not a con contraction property if you look at morphisms. Usually when you look at diffeomorphisms here in general are not morphisms for a Riemannian manifold. Isomorphisms are diffeomorphisms here and here they are Deformations which preserve the metric measure space. Of course, it's more general than a probability space. A probability space has the property, a special property that the measure has one. A dynamical system is less, you know, uh, has less kind of conditions. A topological dynamical system needs needs a topological space. So here uh, with delta set and simplicial set, there are, I had once an argument with AI. It was an interesting conversation, and I convinced. Uh, <laughs> convinced it that it's actually this arrow, even so on Wikipedia you saw the other arrow and that's what ChatGPT of course learned. And uh, but simplicial sets have kind of two type of maps, DI and SI, and they have to uh, have some compatibility condition and it especially doesn't allow the DI to be zero, constant zero, while here we can have dot constant zero. It's a kind of an example of a simple delta set. It's also a hypergraph, kind of a set of sets, but it's still a delta set because we can just take d equal to zero. That satisfies the axiom of a delta set. So we have lots of interesting sources for delta sets. Uh, I generate most of the examples as, you know, simple graphs. Or here, this is a a graph I want to talk a little bit more about. It's the Königsberg graph, the first graph which historically appeared in mathematics. Euler looked at that in the context of the bridges of Königsberg. And uh, so this is a multigraph and it defines naturally a quiver. Quiver can be seen as a one-dimensional, not a simplicity complex, a one-dimensional delta set. It's not a simplicity complex, right? Because we have kind of these multiplicities here. There are some of the edges come with multiplicities. These are the multiple connections here. So this is an example of a multigraph and it uh, yeah, defines a, a, a delta set. So what I was thinking about this week is whether we can associate to a quiver also a more general, higher dimensional delta set. Similarly, then we have this Wigniff upgrade, which can get us from a finite simple graph, gets us a simplicity complex. Just take the complete subgraphs as your uh, set of 
vertex sets of complete subgraphs, which is a finite abstract simplicity complex, a finite set of sets closed on the operation of taking finite non-empty subsets. So this is kind of an upgrade, and here of a quiver, you can upgrade it to a delta set which is one-dimensional. You just have to construct the D. What you have to construct is the Dirac matrix. The Dirac matrix encodes all these face maps which you have in a delta set. So it's an exterior derivative. What I like very much about delta sets is it produces you the calculus we know, just in a finite setting. Right? We have here I'm looking at the Königsberg graph, which is a you know, historically the most important, most famous graph. Uh, I wrote it down as a as a delta set. So there are zero dimensional parts, there is a one dimensional part, and I also included here now to a two dimensional part, the triangles. Right? There are two triangles here, it's kind of the meat which you have. We don't want to leave that out in general. We think about this as a two dimensional mathematical uh, structure. But uh, in order to do that, what you can do is you can associate to this a Dirac operator. So what you have to give is the inclusion maps, right? You have to give the gradient, you have to give the divergence, we have to give the curl. That's what happens in two dimensions. There's only these cases. In higher dimensions, in the three-dimensional part, there would be higher dimensional versions. And uh, so then, then you take d squared, the condition of a delta set is just that this is now a Hodge, you know, has a Hodge decomposition into blocks. There's a zero dimensional Laplacian, which is the Kirchhoff Laplacian. I just uh, upgraded a paper I wrote two years ago, and it's on the archive again, upgraded a little bit. Also, with mathematical code, which gives you this uh, from a general quiver, gives you the Dirac matrix, or the exterior derivative, and also the uh, Laplacian, but not with this part here. So simplicity that also affects this Laplacian. So this Laplacian is different than the Laplacian we have. Uh, so this is D0, uh, D0, D0 star plus D1, D, D, D1 star D1, right? So this is, in this case, more complicated, has two parts. While this is then just d2 star d2. So d2 star gives you from a two form a one form, d2 d2 star gives you again a two form. So that's the, the two triangles, so this is a two times two matrix. In this case, we see there is no cohomology, this is an invertible matrix, so there is no cohomology in b2. Euler characteristic which you can define matches the combinatorial. Definition. This is a uh, Euler Poincare which holds in any for any delta set. As soon as you have a Dirac matrix, you have this McKean-Singer symmetry, and you can let the heat flow uh, work on the forms, and you get the harmonic forms in the limit. So that's what I, I wanted. Also, maybe kind of because it's remarks, I was thinking also a little bit about Erdős Reynri. You know the probability space. In the case of quivers, what is the kind of natural probability space? So what you can do is, unlike in a finite simple graph where the, if you fix n, you can only put finitely many n times n minus one half edges, the maximal, so they are bounded. For a quiver, it's not bounded. You can take uh, as many loops, for example, as you want, or as many multiple connections as you want. So you have to put the probability measure on and if the space and say, okay, say for example, that if you want to have m edges, then the probability is p to the m 1 minus p, which is a geometric distribution, switch p mi 1 minus p. But then you can also compute the expectation of the Euler characteristic as a one dimensional complex. I don't yet know the expectation if you look at it as a higher dimensional complex. That's more interesting and I solved this once for the Whitney complex. For the Whitney complex I computed the average Euler characteristic for a random finite simple graph about 10 years ago. <clears throat> so that's what I wanted to say today. <laughs>
Thank you.